Hello. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. If you see my lips moving, you're an excellent lip reader and you do not hear me, uh, please type into the chat box and let me know that you can hear me. Uh, hopefully, good, excellent. Um, first of all, welcome. I uh, appreciate you being here and uh, taking a little bit of time of your, fr or your Friday. I'm getting a little ahead of myself of your Monday afternoon uh, to listen to this. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to make this a, as brief and as uh, clear cut as we can make it, and uh, leave as much time as we can for for talking through any questions that you might have or for addressing things. We have tried to streamline this process as much as we possibly can. Uh, so I will be laying everything out for you, handing you a few tools during out, during the session today, uh, and then handing it off to to you to take for the next uh, two weeks, a little over two weeks for the review process. Before we get too much into things, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we've got a small group, uh, eight, actually more than I anticipated this afternoon. We had a large session this morning. Uh, since we have a smaller session, I went ahead and activated everybody's microphones uh, or it gave you access to use your microphones. If you'd like to turn on your mics, uh, you can click on the microphone icon at the top of your screen until it turns green. Uh, once it's green, that means your microphone is activated. All you have to do then is click it one more time, a little slash mark will go through your microphone, and that means it's muted. I'll ask that you do mute your microphone throughout the session. Uh, that way we don't have uh, background noise uh, and the like. Uh, but please don't hesitate to turn on your microphone and ask questions uh, throughout the session. Uh, don't feel like you need to click the raise hand icon or anything of the sort. We're a small enough group. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a problem. If you don't want to turn on your microphone, which I completely understand, uh, feel free to use the chat pod and uh, questions, comments, concerns you may have in there. Uh, I also would encourage you, if you uh, just have gotten in, uh, just type a little bit of something about yourself so we can all get to know each other. Uh, we're going to be working together uh, for the next few weeks, and so it's always nice to know who you're working with, uh, maybe make some connections that you didn't realize were there, uh, and, and get to know each other. Uh, we're a community, uh, but I like to make it as small as we possibly can so we can all get to know each other. Uh, so that's one way you can do it is by just uh, typing a little bit of background information about yourself in that chat pod. Uh, with that, you'll notice in the room, in the bottom right-hand corner of our uh, Connect room today, I've got a short agenda, uh, what we're going to be going over, the, the order of things. And in the bottom-hand corner, you will see, uh, for your reference, the makeup of the proposals that you're going to be looking at. And we'll talk through the details of it, we'll talk through the criteria, we'll talk about the, uh, the various tools that we have available for you. Uh, and we'll get all into that. Uh, but the first thing that I want to do, the, the first thing I want to say, and you're, you're going to be sick of me saying this because I will say it again and again, you'll see it in all the emails I sent out to you, is thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for volunteering to do this. Uh, this process could not happen without you. That is not an exaggeration. That, that is not hyperbole. Uh, our research initiation grant process uh, is founded on the work that our reviewers and our review com uh, community uh, does for us. Uh, it is, uh, it has been an honor working with many of you. And I, I'm, a few of you have uh, have reviewed for us before, so I, I particularly thank you for coming back. Uh, that that means that it wasn't too painful last time uh, that you've come back, so that's a good thing. Uh, and for those of you who are in this process, we're going to try to make it as simple as we possibly can for you. Uh, so that it doesn't take too much of your precious time, uh, but that it also gives you a good experience, uh, allows you to get a glimpse of some of the really innovative things that are going on here at Penn State and, and in higher education in general and learning in general, uh, and to give you a glimpse of that and to get a sense of that excitement. Uh, I run the research initiation grant process for, for COIL, and it is one of the most exciting parts of my job because I get to see these ideas and, and see the sparks of ideas at the very beginning uh, of some things that have that really change learning at Penn State and beyond. Uh, and it's not often you get to say that, uh, but this process gets you right in on that edge. And you'll get to review proposals of some new and innovative ideas. So there's a pitch. You're already sold. You're here. So I, I don't have to give too hard of a pitch. So thank you. 
if you have not uh, participated in a COIL research initiation grant review process before, it may be a little bit different than other review processes you've been through before. And that's mostly because this is Penn State money uh, for Penn State people. Uh, we encourage collaborative teams and bringing in outside groups and outside nonprofits, not outside for-profits, outside institutions for higher learning. Uh, we encourage that. But in the end, our PIs are Penn State people, and we coil the, uh, our, our, our Penn State as well. So we do things a little bit different than you may have done in other uh, review sites. That said, it is critical to us that this is a rigorous process. Uh, we, this round, received 30 submissions. Uh, we, do, we do two rig cycles a year. Uh, during this cycle, we received 30 submissions, our highest number of submissions yet. Uh, this is our sixth round that we are going through right now. Uh, 30 submissions, and uh, we had 57 reviewers uh, uh, offer to conduct re reviews for us. We have a reviewer committee of 50 people this time. Uh, so we have a, a great bunch of people around the table, a, a large and great number of ideas at the table. Uh, so this should be a really exciting rig process for us. One of the things uh, that you're going to be doing during this review process is you're going to be focused on a criterion-based review. We have tried to define as best we can, without being too limiting, we have tried to define as best we can specific criteria for our proposals that you're going to have in front of you. And your job will be to view or read the proposals in light of those criteria and to then rate them using an online rating tool, Qualtrics, if you're familiar with it. Uh, this is not going to be, uh, you're not going to be rating uh, or uh, ranking proposals against one another. We will do that with the raw scores, that are the mean scores that come out from all of the reviews that are done. Each proposal, each of those 30 proposals, will be reviewed 8 to 10 times, all depending. Uh, so there are going to be a large number of reviews, relatively large number of reviews for each one of the proposals, and we should have an enormous amount of great feedback. Uh, for each one of them, and uh, upon which we can make the decisions for funding uh, for those projects. And this is where your involvement is critical, because those decisions, what is funded and what is not funded, largely is in your lap as reviewers. What will happen is you will conduct these reviews, you and your 49 cohort, uh, you will all work together to review the proposals, you will submit your scores to us, we will put them all together, get the means. Uh, we'll also do some uh, statistical analysis about later. Uh, and then that will rank the proposals that will then be brought to the four co-directors and myself of COIL. And we will sit down and look at those recommendations. And generally the decision that we make is where the cutoff is for funding. So we will look, and I'm anticipating that we'll probably fund five projects. Uh, a large of it, a lot of it depends on what the ask is, what the what the bottom line is for uh, how much money they're asking for for each one of the proposals. But we fund roughly two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars per cycle. Uh, so we will look at that. We will look at how much is being asked for, and that probably is going to come out to five or six proposals. So, with that said, um, most of the work that you're going to be doing is going to be uh, in AIM. I think. Uh, we do have an outside reviewer here. So if you're not familiar with ANGEL, ANGEL is Penn State's uh, CMS. And it is going to be the place where we house all the materials and the proposals for this review process. Uh, if you do not already have access to ANGEL, you should have received an email from either myself or my graduate assistant, Megan McDonald, today uh, to help you get access. You may have already received an email from ANGEL. You know that you've been added to a new group. And we'll go through those in just a second. You will also receive, separate from the email from Angel, a, an email from Megan uh, letting you know what your assigned proposals are. You will be assigned five proposals uh, to read and to rate and to review. Uh, those five proposals have already been checked for any sort of conflicts of interest, but it is never a perfect process because we are a small community 
and there are connect ties that perhaps we are not privy to. So one of the things that I always ask our reviewers is we do our due diligence as much as we can to help identify conflicts of interest in advance. If there is a conflict of interest that you identify when you receive your review assignments, please contact me as soon as possible, let me know, and we will uh, change things around a little bit. We'll take those reviews away from you, give them to someone else, and, and, and just shift the chairs a little bit. Uh, so just let me know as soon as possible. So I know you're not going to have an opportunity to actually do the reviews as soon as you get the email, but if you wouldn't mind looking at your assignments, going in and looking at those proposals, looking at the, the uh, team makeup, and seeing if you have any uh, glaring conflicts of interest that we should know about. The way I will identify conflicts of interest in this context, we are a big community, but we're a small community, particularly the people working right on this innovation. Uh, you will often see the same names pop up in some of these proposals again and again and again, not as PI, but as supporting individuals, particularly uh, people who are working for TLT, uh, which is you know a great support in this space here at Penn State, and you will see some of their names pop up again and again and again. Um, so I'm not too terribly concerned with you knowing. Uh, if that was our bar for conflict of interest, we wouldn't have any re internal reviewers uh, conducting reviews because everyone would have a conflict of interest. But what we are asking is if you work for uh, someone or you report to someone who is a PI on a project or the other way around, uh, if, if uh, someone reports to you uh, that is a PI on a project, we would ask them that you let us know and we find that particular project. Uh, if you're simply familiar with someone, you go to the same meetings, uh, I'm going to leave that up to you whether you feel that there will be interest or not. We are going to take care of the glaring ones. Uh, obviously, no PIs are going to be on the review committee. No PIs are going to be uh, reviewing their own proposal, or uh, individuals won't be reviewing proposals on which they're a uh, team member. Uh, but any of the other com potential conflicts of interest, let us know. We'll get it fixed. Enough said about that. Uh, Review assignments will come to you in an email, and then you will go to the angel space in order to actually find the proposals. You should see, oh, no you don't, I am going to share my screen right now so that you can see. There we go. You should be seeing right now uh, the COIL website at the top scene where it says COIL call for proposals. I'm actually at the RFP page right now. Uh, this is the RFP that all of the proposers have saw and that they read through before actually sending in their proposals. We are as transparent as we possibly can be, up to and including providing proposers or PIs with the rubric that you as reviewers will be using to review these, uh, these submissions. Uh, so we are out there on the table. Uh, in this document, if you're curious to look through it, uh, you can go through and find the breakdown of what the proposal should look like, uh, but I also have that in the proposal sections within our connect window here down in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, I break that down with the key uh, parts of the, of the uh, proposal. Then you will see the criteria for project selection. And here each one of the criteria uh, are identified. Uh, guiding questions are provided to think through when thinking about that criteria, as well as how many points uh, go into that section. This is public. Everybody can see this. All of our proposer, proposers saw this. Uh, you are going to get a little bit more guidance being reviewers. We're going to try to make it a little bit easier for you. But in the past, we've had many reviewers ask us to see the RFP uh, so they could orient themselves and familiarize themselves with it. If you'd like to see it, it's coil.psu.edu slash rigs. If you go to our website, it's under Grants, Call for Rig Proposals, and you're always welcome to see that. We also have that in our ANGEL site. So if you go to ANGEL, which is cms.psu.edu, and don't worry about knowing or remembering all these links. We will send them to you in an email uh, before 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. When you go to ANGEL, over in your migration, you should see a review or a group that is Coil Rig Reviews Spring 2015. If you click on that 
and go into that section, you will see everything you need, your toolkit for this review. Uh, everything should be here with the exception of one thing, and that is your actual review assignment. The reason we have moved to keeping those assignments secret or, or private is that we try as best we can to make the review process anonymous. Um, we in the past had provided a uh, essentially a, a table where we had all the reviewers listed and the assignments that they had. Uh, but what that allowed is it could allow the potential for someone to use that as a key or a cross-reference to figure out the anonymized uh, reviews that are done later. And just to simplify that and, and a little bit uh, uh, more difficult to figure out or, or, or make it even more anonymous is we are now only privately emailing you your review assignments. And you should be receiving that from Megan if you have not already uh, before the end of the day today. Uh, that was the only place you'll be able to get that. So if you forget it, if you accidentally delete, send me or uh, send Megan an email and we will remind you of what your assignments are. And in that assignment, you will see, you, uh, for instance, uh, it will say, Brad Zedenik, you have been assigned proposal A, B, C, A, B, C, D, and E. Those are your uh, proposals to review. What I would then do is I would come into the angel group right here. And here in proposals, find all of the proposals that have been submitted. All of them preceded by a letter, A through DD. Uh, we had a fair number of proposals. We, we've never had the problem where we had to start using double letters. Uh, so it's a good problem to have, and we might have to switch that around next time. Uh, the way we proposals are here, and you can access them right now, uh, with the exception of two that are still yet to be uploaded. Uh, all the proposals are here. If you wanted to get a jump on things, you could start doing reviews right now. Uh, I'd prefer that you listen to this and then you can start getting uh, going on your proposals. But within the uh, Angel site, not only those proposals, but all the other tools that you may possibly need. First, there is a link to the RFP. That's what I was just showing you on our website. Uh, that will bring you to the COIL website and through there. If you want to get, download a PDF of it that for easy reference, you can click here and you can get a PDF of the RFP. Uh, that you can print out, have next to your desk for, for reference if you'd like to. Uh, again, most of these are in response to things that past reviewers have requested from us. So we're, we're trying to provide you with everything you may need. You might not need half of it. Next, you will see a section that says how to conduct and submit reviews. Under here, I give you a step-by-step uh, -step how to do a review. I'm going to walk you through it right now. But so you don't have to worry about taking notes. You can always go right back here and walk through the process step by step. It will tell you everything that you need to do. And it's a pretty simple process. But to walk through it with you, what will happen is you'll receive your assignments. And say I get an assignment that says Brad proposals is proposal A. Well, I will come up here. I will click on A. I will open up that document. And here is the proposal for me to read. I can print this off. I can read it online. Personally, what I do is I download it to my tablet, uh, the Adobe Reader app uh, for either Android or iOS uh, is fantastic. Allows you to to write in the margins. Allows you to highlight things. Uh, it's in like uh, that. That's the way I personally do it. You can do it however you like, uh, but you can read the proposal and um, and you can start to look at the criteria that we have for the proposals and to document where you think it lies on those criteria. Something that we provide to you to help you along in that process is actually two things. First, you will notice that there is a rig reviewer worksheet. This is something that many people have requested in the past uh, because they did not want to do the work directly in the online forums. They wanted something where they could jot down notes, uh, you know, whether they're traveling uh, or, or whether they're just sitting at home watching TV and they're doing these uh, reviews and they want to jot down their notes. They wanted some sort of paper-based or, or electronic document-based way of doing this. So what you can do is you can click on there and you can get a worksheet that is broken down uh, to allow you to jot down notes and conduct the reviews in, in, in a digital way. Uh, and basically what we do is allow you to put in the PI name so you can identify which one of the proposals are you reviewing. And then under each section, 
we give you the criteria, the point value for that criteria, and then we provide you with guiding questions to think through in determining what may be for that section. And I'll actually go through these criteria in a few minutes so that, that we can get on the same page as they mean, uh, because some of these terms can ha definitely have different interpretations. Uh, or at least variations on a theme of a definition. So this worksheet uh, you can see is relatively short, it's three pages, uh, four pages, well, three and a half here, uh, ten different criteria that we ask for, uh, and you can simply jot down the number out of three points, how many would you give it, and then comments. I'll go ahead and make this, uh, say this now. Comments are critical. Uh, each one of these proposals is going to receive 8 to 10 reviews. What that means is because these are seed grants, these are early stage uh, proof of concept pilot project uh, type endeavors, this is, they are typically at a stage where comments and feedback are critical for refining and developing the ideas. Particularly since we see these as seed grants where the coil rig grant or rig is not the end of the road. It is hopefully a first step on the road to an NSF grant, to an NIH grant, uh, to an IES grant. Uh, it's a stepping stone to those larger external funding agencies or external funding. The best way for PIs to be able to refine their proposal, make it better, and have a, a good shot at those higher level funding, uh, at those higher level funding agencies, is to get your uh, reasoned feedback, your uh, your your best instincts, based on your experience as a review as a proposer, uh, as a person in the field, as a person in the field of learning, and to get your feedback and direction that they can then incorporate into their proposal for the next round, even if they're not funded. I said we're going to fund probably three projects, or I'm sorry, about five projects. We have 30 since most likely 24 or 25 of these are not going to be funded by COIL this, this time around. Those 24, 25 projects could really use your feedback to help make their proposals better, whether that's for a resubmission for a COIL grant in the fall, or whether that's going for a larger funding source or a different funding source if the match is just not very good. Uh, but your comments and, and feedback are critical. No matter what, I do beg of you, if you have a section, for instance, innovation, and it's 10 points, and you score them at a 1, please provide some feedback and comments as to why you gave that score. And for that matter, if you give a 10, if you have standout scores, uh, please provide as much commentary as you can as to why you gave that score. There are a few different reasons for that. One of them being that we will have our reviewer meeting on June 5th. You should know about it. It's been in a few of the emails that I've sent out. During that meeting, we're going to be discussing these reviews, and we're specifically going to be speaking about some of the outlying scores that reviewers have given. If you happen to be one of those outlying scores, uh, in this section, eight other reviewers gave this proposal a 9, and you gave it a 1. It is very helpful for us to know why you gave it that one. For one reason, this is anonymous. I am the only individual at this university that will know who a reviewer is on a particular uh, review. Uh, and I need to know that simply because I need to know who has conducted the reviews and who has not uh, so that I can reassign things if necessary. But it never goes beyond me. So when we sit in that meeting, no one in that room will have any idea who gave it the one. And if you don't want to stand up and say, hey, I'm the one who gave it that one, if you don't want to speak out in that context, having the comments there to help guide the rationale behind that score will help me advocate for the position of your position for that score. And what often happens during that, that review is when we talk through some of these scores, often other reviewers' minds are changed. So in this case, if all the other reviewers gave it an, uh, an 8 out of 10 and you gave it a, a 1 
And I read that often other reviewers will go, oh, that, that's, that's a good point. I, I hadn't thought of it like that. And then often will be willing to change their scores. And sometimes it works the other way around. Uh, you know, it can have all twos and you gave it an eight. And if you provide that perspective in the comments, it can really help. I, I don't want to hammer this point too terribly much, but the comments are critical. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, but as you go through, all 10 of the criteria are on this worksheet and you can use this worksheet. Otherwise, you can go directly to the link to submit reviews. And this will bring you to a Qualtrics survey uh, where you can enter all of your review scores digitally. Now one of the things, uh, when you're looking at this and you're looking at provide, uh, entering these scores and you look at, okay, the, Brad, the innovation is 10 points. Uh, what am I going to give it? Well, what's the difference between a four and a six? How, how are you to judge the distinctions there? And what we try to do is provide you with some guidance in that. And being, being an educator, uh, my, my background uh, started as a middle school teacher before moving on to higher education uh, and uh, doctoral program in educational leadership. Uh, I, I'm all for rubrics, so I built a rubric. Uh, the rubric is also right here. This rubric was also available to all the uh, PIs, to all the proposers uh, for this project uh, or for this process. So this is, again, not a seat. Everybody can see this. But if you click on the rubric and you can print this off and keep it on your desk as a reference, you will see each one of the criteria. You will see the same wordings that you will find uh, in that worksheet that I just showed you, as well as in the Qualtrics survey that we'll look at in a second. And then it provides you with uh, some guidance as to what the distinctions are between each one of the point values. Now you'll notice there are only five points here. Why is that? Right? You just saw the innovation it had a possible 10 points. Well, as we know from survey research, human beings are not extremely good at uh, discerning between uh, more than about five, five different levels, uh, not arguably, five different levels of, of distinction between, uh, between things. And so what we do here is we allow you to choose one through five, and then for this important category, because it's important, we multiply that score by two. Uh, so if you give it zero, two times zero is zero. If they didn't have the section, they're getting a zero for that section. It's as simple as that. Uh, if you give them one point, they will actually get a two. If you give them two, multiply by two, four, six, eight, ten. Uh, and that's the way that, uh, that the points will be assigned uh, for each one of these sections. So if you see a, a multiplier at the end, that means that's a, an important section. And whatever score you give it, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, will be multiplied by 2 for the, for the final uh, score that it gets for that criterion. And other sections you'll see are just 1, so that's only worth 5 points. At the very end, we have one section that only has uh, 3 points possible. And so you'll see you can't actually give it uh, the, the scores. You can give it a 1, a 2, or a 3, and that's it. Uh, zero, one, two, or three, I guess I should say. Uh, and and that's, that's how we break it out here. So uh, this is the rubric that you can use. You can print this off, have it with you. You can uh, access it digitally throughout the, uh, in the Angel session if you'd like. Uh, but it's there for you and can help you guide uh, or help guide you in your uh, scoring as you go along. But the important is the actual uh, review. And if you choose not to do the worksheets and you just want to go right into the digital form and enter these in as you uh, finish reading proposals, that's great. Honestly, that's the way I do it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not big on doing the worksheets. I tend to jot notes in the margins. Uh, and then I go through and I go through the, the, uh, the digital form at the end. And that's how I, I do my reviews. Disclosure, I, I am not actually a reviewer for the uh, COIL rigs because I'm in on the final decision-making process. Uh, no one here at COIL in the, in the reviews. Uh, only our 50 uh, reviewers that have volunteered as well as some external reviewers are involved. So if you click on the link to submit reviews, you will see, and hopefully you can still see this, you will see a form come up that says, this survey requires a password. Uh, we want to make it, uh, at least put a barrier up for people being able to just come in and, and, uh, and get into our, our form, into our survey. So we put a password. The password is COIL rig. 
No, Brad, what if I forget that? Easy enough. You go into, uh, into Angel, you go into the How to Conduct and Submit Reviews, and you'll look through your steps. Uh, here, where are the proposals? There's the worksheet, uh, link to submit reviews, which I just clicked on, and it will open in a new window, and you will be asked for a password, which is Coil Rig. So if you forget it, there it is. It's Coil Rig, no period. It actually looks like that period is red. I'll have to go back in there and, and fix that so that period isn't red and it's not confusing. But if you go into the Qualtrics survey and type in Coil Rig and hit the forward button, enter in Qualtrics does not be forward. Uh, so you have to click that little forward button every time you're done with it. You'll get to the first page of the review. Please, please be careful on this page. Uh, this is where we ask you who you are and review your you are conducting or which proposal you are reviewing. Um, I can figure it out after the fact uh, through the deduction. I can figure out if you clicked on the wrong name, which we're actually going to, uh, which is another reason why why I have access to who's who and who's doing which reviews. Uh, but it makes it so much easier for me if you if you just take a second and make absolutely certain that when you click on name a reviewer and you pick yourself. Uh, alphabetical order by last name. Uh, so I am always best. Uh, you click on your name and just make sure your name is up in that when you click it. Uh, again, it'll make it so much easier for me. And then you will click over here for which proposal you are reviewing. Again, please just double check and make sure you click the right one. You click outside here. Sometimes you can accidentally click a different proposal. Uh, for now, I'm going to do our test proposal, uh, just so I can show you how this works. And then I'll click forward. Let's see. My name's there. It's the correct proposal. I click forward. Now I come into what you saw in the worksheet, just in digital uh, survey form. And what I'm going to do now is, as I'm walking through this, I'm just about a few of these criteria uh, and to make them a little bit more clear, particularly the confusing ones. And the confusing one is this right here. Uh, innovation. This is one of those terms that mean different to everybody that hears it. What is an innovation? It seems simple at first, but quite honestly, we've been within COIL for the last two years uh, to get a solid definition of this. Uh, but I, th we, we've done it at this point, and you can see that reflected here in this first criterion. And you also notice that innovation is the first thing we ask about. Uh, it's also the highest point value. There are a few other 10-point uh, criteria, but 10 points is the highest you will have in any session. Innovation and impact on learning are critical to us, and so they're the first two things. I, and I will just read this to you, what COIL means by innovation. COIL defines innovation as the research, development, or introduction of something new or novel, be it an idea, a device, an approach, with the intent of learning. So that's relatively clear, hopefully. But what we do then is we provide you some questions to ask yourself when you finish reading your proposal to, to figure out, is this innovative? So first we, ask you, you, we say to you, OK, ask yourself, does, does this proposal, is this, is this something, uh, a research or development project that's new or novel? Have I heard of this before? Or is this unique? Does this sound different from the way we have th the way we have done things thus far? Or is it something that is on that that bleeding edge uh, of innovation, that bleeding edge of learning and learning design and and pedagogy? Uh, and so you ask that question yourself, and then go a little bit further. Uh, does a proposal represent innovation potential for long term impact? You can have innovations. That are uh, that are micro in nature that will, will apply to a uh, to a particular specific idiosyncratic problem uh, in a course or or that a, a faculty or a staff member uh, faces, but Coil is much more interested in something that has uh, potential for long-term impact and broader impact, not just at Penn State, definitely not at in a specific course, not Penn State but across higher education, across learning. Um, so that's one of the things we want you to ask yourself, is, is this an innovation 
uh, that's that's broader than that. That's bigger than than a, the particular problem that is that is specified in the in the proposal, and can it have a long term impact. And then these next two uh, to me are are key. Does the proposal represent an innovation that is not a refinement on an existing process, technology, or approach? And this goes hand in hand with the next one. Does the proposal represent an innovation that is not applying an existing approach to a new context. This one a lot of people stumble over and and remember this is Coyle's definition of innovation. Uh, you might interact with another group that defines innovation a little bit different but this is what we have settled down on for these research initiation grants. Let me give you an example or actually a non-example. So that last question uh, is it an innovation that's not applying an existing approach to a new context? We had a submission uh, some cycles ago uh, where uh, someone was proposing using a video conferencing technology uh, in a mentoring program in the College of Nursing. And this particular scenario or this particular argument that was made in the proposal was uh, video, video conferencing had never been used in a mentoring context in nursing before. And that this was going to be new and novel for nursing. Uh, because it had never had widespread adoption and had never really been tried uh, for a, a multitude of, of reasons. The proposal was great. It was well written, good idea. I, I definitely thought that it was going that it could impact learning uh, for for these for these interns and for these people that uh, were getting the early nursing experiences. Uh, it had the potential term impact. The video conferencing is not new. It, it's it's a well-tread area. There's a lot of research, a lot of research in, uh, in, in its application, a lot of research in a number of different contexts. The fact that this this thing was going to be applied in a new context does not meet the standard that we set for the COIL research initiation grants. And so to me that is a proposal that would have been very low on the innovation scale. Uh, very low on the innovation scale. To uh, early on, in fact, our first cycle of uh, research initiation grants, uh, we funded the development of the Penn State Digital Badging Tool. This was before Purdue came out with theirs. This was uh, when there were a few upstarts in the field, uh, but within particularly higher education, institutes of higher education, really wasn't much and there definitely was not a tool that met the needs in a higher education context. We funded the development of that, the further development of that tool. Uh, that was new. It was not a new context. It hadn't been done other places. It was just new. A uh, project that we funded uh, has to do with the development of an interactive online game that uses eye gaze uh, for individuals uh, on the autism spectrum to help them build social or identify social cues and, and uh, build their ability to maintain eye gaze uh, with other people. Uh, this was a game or an approach at teaching those sort of social skills I've tried before. Uh, it, it wasn't just applying it to this new context of individuals on the autism spectrum. That type of game had never been done before. Uh, so that was a project that we funded that would be high on innovation. Uh, so these are some examples of where we would fall on this innovation scale. And I think you probably still struggle with some of the proposals that you have. Uh, having read about half of them now, um, and I'll read the rest in the coming week, having read about half of them now, there are a few of them where I sat there thinking to myself, I I'm not sure if this is an innovation or not. I really need to think about it. And that's going to be one of the hardest things for you as a reviewer is to really think about uh, what whether you think it's an innovation or not. And then let me hammer this home again. This is where comments come in. Uh, so when you give it that score, give us a comment. Let us know why you put it in uh, for this score that you gave. Uh, but to move forward, you'll score it. <clears throat> Wherever you score it, you will put in your comment and then you will click forward and move on to the uh, to the next criteria. Is enhancing learning. Another 10 point category. And these are the first two sections of the proposal. Uh, after the cover page, you'll notice down in our, uh, our proposal sections in the bottom left-hand corner of our connect when abstract is 200 words, and that's just to orient you. Uh, that's not actually really uh, reviewed. 
innovation 200 words, impact on learning for 200 words. Uh, we want to get it right out there in the front. However, let me be clear, these two criteria are not simply based on those two 200 word sections. We are asking you to read the entire proposal and then conduct the review. We are trying to force our proposers to, to, to define innovation and to define the way it's going to enhance learning by making them do that 200 word section. But our hope is that they are then going to expand upon that within the five page narrative. So read the entire proposal then come back and, and conduct this review. So enhancing learning. Does it have the potential to impact or to improve teaching and learning through an online innovation? Uh, that should be pretty clear. It's in both our name and, and what this is. Uh, does Is it innovation, long-term impact? We talked about that. And is it of uh, interest in the field of online learning? So these are the things that you would ask yourself as you're going through and conducting the review. So I will put in a score. I will put in a comment and move forward. Alignment with the COIL themes of personalization access and quality at scale. COIL has tried to focus in on uh, our efforts on, on particular problems that we have identified or that we have had identified for us by constituent groups across Penn State and beyond. And three of those that have really risen to the surface in the last few years are personalization, access to education, and scale. And I'll talk about these three just so we're on the same page. Personalization, uh, I think most of us know. This is, this is personalization of the learning process for the individual. Uh, it's leveraging online innovation in order to create a more personalized environment in which our, our students, our learners, can, can interact and, with both each other and the material. Uh, so that's personalization. Access confuses some people sometimes. Access is not accessibility in the traditional format of uh, captioning and, and uh, you know, text readers and the like uh, for uh, having individuals uh, with disabilities being able to access content, although that can be part of it. But it's the access to high quality of education for everyone whether that be non-traditional learners, whether that be uh, at-risk groups, uh, whether that be individuals that are outside of Pennsylvania uh, or outside of geographic area, uh, those sort of things. The access to a high quality of education and, and high quality uh, learning tools and learning experiences. And then third, quality at scale, uh, providing that quality educational experience at scale. Uh, so this is where you're getting into the realm of, of the MOOCs and, and, and the like, uh, or all the derivatives of, of MOOCs, MOOCs, so on and so forth, uh, where essentially you're looking at scaling up these learning experiences uh, beyond what a typical brick and mortar classroom can handle uh, and leveraging online uh, innovations for that. And we ask again, you'll notice long-term impact. You've seen this three times now in three criteria. Uh, does it have the potential for long-term impact in one of those one of those focus areas that we have? Personalization, access, quality, and scale. We'll give it a score, comment, and move on to the next criteria. R&D team is well prepared to execute the project. This is a section where some of the supporting material for this is actually going to be found in the appendices that you are not required to read. So in the proposal sections that you'll see down in the bottom left-hand corner of our Connect session, you'll see the primary sections of the proposal. There is also the ability, uh, we have provided uh, our proposers with the ability to put in appendices of any link that they want. Uh, but that is given to them uh, with the acknowledgement that our reviewers are not required to read through those appendices. Uh, we ask that you read through the proposer, uh, proposal sections that are defined here, uh, but that you use the appendices as necessary. So whether you skim those or you read those uh, verbatim, that is up to you. Uh, I often direct users to keep those appendices short because you as a reviewer are more likely to actually dive into those and look at that material. Uh, but we have had uh, proposers put in as much as 50, 60, 70 pages of appendices. Uh, obviously, you are not required to look through all that. Uh, skim it, see what's there, uh, but 
some of this comes down to the way the proposal is put together. And if it's put together in a way that is difficult for you as a reviewer to read through, unfortunately, that's going to negatively impact their score. Uh, but in the R&D team uh, and their ability to execute, often uh, project team bios are in those appendices. Uh, so if you're not familiar with one of the, uh, with the individuals on, on the, on the uh, uh, research or development team, you can go into those appendices, see their bio, see what their background is, and better assess whether or not they're going to be able to conduct this project based on the people that are at the table. Uh, and we love collaboration. We reward collaboration. So you'll see, does the team reach across departments, units, colleges, and campuses at Penn State and other institutions? Uh, yes, 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 and yes. We really want that. So uh, reward proposers for putting together diverse teams. Uh, if it's a great idea and a diverse team would not necessarily add to the proposal, you know, don't dock a uh, proposal just because it doesn't have a huge team behind it. We don't want we don't want token teams. We want the best team for the project. Uh, but there are times where it's easy. You read a proposal and you think, boy, if they had this person or if they went into this department and had some representation, this would be so much stronger. Uh, if that's the case, then perhaps they get a few a fewer points in this section. But you'll identify one, two, three, four, five. We'll give it a score and comment and move on. Applicability. Um, can it be applied outside of Penn State? Uh, can it be applied outside of the specific text of the proposal uh, or of the research or of the development plan? Again, we want our, our goal, our pie in the sky, our moonshot is that we're going to change learning at Penn State and beyond. That's lofty. Uh, so we want to reward those proposals that have the potential to impact that broadly and that greatly. Uh, so that's a applicability, uh, five points here. And you see your guiding questions. So we'll give a score, we'll give a comment, and move on. We're almost done here. Uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, can, can they do it for the, for the amount of money that, that uh, they have asked for? Or, or are they asking for too much? Uh, if a proposal is surprisingly at $49,999, uh, is a $50,000 maximum grant. Uh, if they're asking for $49,999, perhaps there should be some scrutiny as to what they're spending that money on uh, and whether it is the best use of that money. There are always opportunity costs for every project we fund, for every dollar that goes to a project, that is a dollar that's not going to another project. Uh, so we want you, you to help us assess how that money is being spent in the best way possible. Uh, so is, is there a budget detail? Uh, does the narrative explain the reasons for the funds that they request? And are they reasonable? Uh, and you'll answer those things. Again, good comments will really help us and help the proposers, uh, and then move on to the next section. Feasibility. These two are closely linked, the, uh, the cost effectiveness and feasibility. So the other direction, you look at a proposal and you think, this is going to cost a fortune and it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, and then you look at their, uh, their budget ask uh, and they're asking for $4,000. Uh, and it's, that it is just not going to be sufficient uh, to, to fund what they say they're going to do, uh, whether they don't have enough personnel at the table, whether they... Uh, are vastly under how difficult something may be to do. Uh, this is the feasibility section. Is it a realistic budget? And temporarily, can it be done in the amount of time that they have? These are 12-month grants, seed grants. We provide funding for 18 months, but the actual uh, timeline for research is 12 or development is 12 months. Uh, can the, what they do, can it be done in 12 months? I would caution you to not, uh, uh, to not dismiss some proposals offhand because it looks like it's too ambitious. We want to reward ambition here. Um, and there are times when projects can bring people to the table that can significantly increase the ability of a team to do what they say they're going to do. Uh, I'll give one example. Uh, actually, I, I mentioned the, the eye gaze. Uh, for individuals on the autism spectrum, 
they're going to they were going to develop a, a an interactive game uh build the game code the game, and then get get kids using the game uh and 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 conduct some research based on their interactions with that game in 12 months they hadn't started yet uh they wouldn't be able to start until the money got into their hands often you look at that and think who how are they to do that in 12 months maybe they could build the game in 12 months if the game was already there, maybe they'd do research in 12 months, but both? Well, one of the things they brought to the table was they linked up with the lead developer of uh, at Blizzard Entertainment who put together the World of Warcraft game. Um, that brought a significant experience to the table, uh, significant resources as far as what that individual do to help guide them. Uh, and that, along with some of the other people at the table, uh, that had worked on past projects that were associated, were, were able to, to slingshot them, to shoot them so much further than they would have been otherwise. Uh, so when you look at the people at the table on that research team, you can see, oh, we can do that. A different team? No way that wouldn't have been feasible. But for that particular team, it was. So keep that in mind when, when giving these scores. Uh, so feasibility, five points. Give a score, comment, and uh, research evaluation plan. I'd uh, get another 10 point. These are research initiation grants. Uh, uh, so you need to be looking at uh, research questions, whether they're well formed and, and, uh, and specific, and whether the uh, methodology is appropriate for, for what's being done. Uh, and if it's development project, whether there's an evaluation plan in place and whether it's well formed and well designed. Uh, so you can look through that. Uh, that's in the five page narrative. A uh, few different writing questions give it a score. This poor test proposal is not doing so well. I think I've given straight ones. Potential to generate subsequent research and funding. Five points again. These are seed grants. We do not want these projects to end in 18 months or 12 months uh, when COIL funding ends. The intent is to, uh, to use the COIL grant as a stepping stone to larger external funding or funding from other agent, uh, external agencies to bring new money into Penn State and to uh, bring these projects uh, to a broader audience and to bring additional resources to the table to refine them. Uh, so one of the things that we want you to look at is, is this, a, is this a project be appealing to an NSF? Is this a project that would be appealing to an NIH? Uh, Based on your experiences, based on by based upon uh, you know your own familiarity with grant uh, requests that are out there, would these projects have legs, or do you look at them and think, well, that's really really idiosyncratic, or that's you know that's ill-defined, that would have that would really go nowhere outside of Penn State. Um, these are the things that we want you to think about uh, when giving a uh, score for this, up to five points. And again, we provide guiding questions that you can use for, for determining that. And then finally, last uh, criterion is a dissemination plan. Only three points, you remember this from the rubric where I showed you there are only uh, three different distinctions uh, between scores, well, zero and then three, uh, is, is there a dissemination plan? You will notice in the proposal sections that the dissemination plan comes last. Uh, it is a one-page section maximum. And we're simply asking, how are you going to spread the word about this project? Uh, and this can be something as simple as a plan for which conferences are going to present at, or at least apply to, or, or whether this is a lot of journals are going to submit to, uh, are they going to have a white paper, uh, is there going to be some sort of deliverable, are they going to leverage COIL, maybe do a COIL conversation, uh, and leverage the types of events that we do, uh, and use that as, as a method. Whatever it is, it just needs to be defined, uh, which is one of the reasons this is only three points. It's not a 10-point section, but it's important to have it in there uh, because we don't want everyone working in secret in silos. We've got enough of that here. Uh, we want people to be joining in on a larger conversation across the university and, and, and uh, across our field uh, to talk about these projects. So this is where you would, would identify whether or not they've done that, they've met that bar. I'm going to go ahead and give this one a three. There we go. And uh, you identify that, and you move forward. Now, big thing. Uh, you'll notice it says you are 
almost done when you get to this page. You have to do one more thing, and that is to simply click on the forward arrow here to submit your review. When you click on that, on that forward button, it will be sent to us, and then it will be logged. If you want to go back and change answers, you can click back and do that. Uh, but I'm going to click forward, and you'll see and get the little bars. We thank you for your time spent doing this survey. It's been recorded. Done. It's in. And then we can go back to Angel. We can go into the proposals, get our next proposal, and do the same process over again. So Vicki, I just saw you had a question. PS salaries in the budget discouraged. Some grants forbid it. So uh, this is one thing that, that uh, you could answer uh, through the RFP, uh, and I'll go to it here so you can see. Uh, we have a use of funds section. Uh, short answer to your question is we do discourage, although we do not disallow, we discourage uh, for faculty buyout time. Uh, so, so in these cases, our PIs are going to be faculty or staff generally. Uh, sometimes we have students, and I think we have two student submissions this time around, uh, which is great. Uh, PI salaries are not a problem. If it is a faculty member at, uh, here at Penn State, well, it's got to be someone associated with Penn State as a, as a PI. If it is a faculty member, we highly discourage buyout time, and that's because we don't want to take good educators out of the classroom and away from students. That's not the point of this. Uh, that's not furthering our goal. If, however, it's a nine-month faculty member or a nine-month appointment, they want uh, to fund themselves over the summer, that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, so they can put in their salary over the summer months, and, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, for staff, same type of thing. Uh, if they have a short appointment or if they have some sort of buyout, uh, that can be fine, although in the narrative they'd have to justify that and explain why. One of the other reasons why we prefer not to do faculty buyout time is that faculty here at Penn State have a fair amount of research, discretionary research time built into, uh, into their positions. Uh, so they have that ability to conduct this type of research. Staff becomes much more challenging, uh, depending on what department, what, uh, what you're doing, uh, and what your project load is. This, uh, these types of projects may not fit within uh, the regular job description. And so if there is a way of buying out uh, staff members' time, perfectly allowed as well. Uh, but those are things that you have to look case by case basis and, and how it works. Uh, graduate assistant or graduates, uh, graduate students, I'm sorry, uh, can fund their own graduate assistantship. Uh, that one's perfectly acceptable uh, use of funds. In fact, no matter who the PI is, graduate assistantships are one of the most common uses of the money here. Uh, uh, to to fund a GA uh, tuition reimbursement as well as the stipend and, and all the associated fringe. Uh, that is a common use of this funding just to bring more people to the table and, and have someone with the capacity to do the data collection and, and you know the, the hard work of research. Uh, so that was a really long short answer but that's that's the answer. Uh, at this point any any other questions uh, as far as uh, this process, uh, as I said, we, we try to make it as clear and straightforward as possible, uh, but that's that's the whole thing, soup to nuts. Uh, I'm going to give some appropriate wait time, but while I'm doing it, I'm just going to say very quickly, uh, if you have, oh, uh, yeah, gee, I'll, get, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, if you have any questions whatsoever, call me, email me, uh, grab me by the arm as I'm walking through the hallway. Uh, whatever you need to do, I am more than willing to help out in any way that I possibly can. And do not worry about limiting calls to business hours. I prefer, I've prefer i got a, a newborn at home. I prefer you don't call at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, but if you can't get to call me until 6 o'clock, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if I can't answer, I won't answer. Uh, but leave me a message, and I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Um, what you're doing for us is important. And, uh, and we're very appreciative for it, and so I want to support you in any way I can. So uh, do you have an example of an innovative uh, approach without building a new tool or device? Uh, well, I don't know if you just left it out of there or, uh, or what, but uh, one of the innovative approaches could be uh, the development of a new pedagogical approach, uh, perhaps. 
Uh, let me give you an example of one of our earliest uh, funded projects. And I think actually I mentioned this one when I was presenting uh, out at Erie last week uh, that one of our uh, co-directors is involved in. He was uh, one of the committee members or uh, one of the uh, research team members on this project. And it was the development of a tool for identifying uh, learners, self-identified learning styles and developing a toolkit for the application of that knowledge in the delivery of, uh, of the content within a course. Uh, so it was, they weren't building a tool or a device. There was nothing that there, it was uh, much more theoretical uh, in nature, particularly the early project. It's since developed into building some tools around this. But early on, it was them looking at how to build this survey uh, tool in order to help students assess their own best learning styles and how to help instructors uh, and teachers to leverage those learning styles in their course design in order to, to best meet the needs of their students. Uh, that would be one example of them. And one of the things that you can do is you can go into grants on our website and the, in the RIG index and you can see every project we have funded. Uh, and you can look through and see what we mean by, by fundable projects or innovative projects. Uh, and that's a great way of doing it. Also, on the RFP, we have examples of uh, exemplar proposals. Uh, that's under grants, call for proposals. At the very bottom, you will see, uh, here we go highly rated proposals, and you can see some examples there. Any other questions? All right. Well, with that, I'll leave you with a, a, another huge thank you. Uh, June 2nd is when all pro uh, close of business, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, June 2nd is when all proposals are due. You will receive your assignments uh, prior to 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. They may be out before the end of the day today. Uh, and then our full rig reviewer meeting is going to be June 5th. Uh, and that is from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. If you can join us for that, we would highly encourage it. And we, we would love to have you there. Uh, if you can't, we understand. But uh, if you can visit us or you can uh, join us online, that would be great as well. So with that, I want to say thank you. Have a great rest of your afternoon, great rest of your week. And if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. Bye-bye.